This is uh, Isaiah for uh, beginners. This is lesson number four. Title of this lesson, Structures and Features. This is part three. So we've noted that the uh, book of Isaiah is not a history. It's not a, a narrative like the book of Acts, for example. Uh, book of Acts, for example, Luke provides a, a historical narrative of the establishment of the church in Jerusalem at the early part of the first century. And he goes forward you know, with key events that take place, introduces different characters uh, in the development of the story, uh, up to Paul's imprisonment in Rome about 64 AD, you know, from about 33 AD to about 64 AD. You know, it tells that story uh, in linear fashion. It's concise, it's historical, it's easy to plot on a graph easy to follow, not saying that there are no you know, interesting and deep uh, teachings in the book of Acts, but you, know, you can follow them one after another. Usually uh, it's the first book that uh, young preachers uh, teach because uh, it's, it's easy to kind of teach a chapter after chapter. Um, Isaiah, on the other hand, is completely different. Aside from a few chapters of historical information uh, at about the middle point of the book, Isaiah's writings are the product of visions and prophecies recorded in poetic form uh, and different, actually, uh, different types of poetic form. Uh, in the book of Acts, for example, in Acts chapter 11, 28, there's a prophet there too, Agabus. But what does Agabus do? He says, well, there's going to be a famine. Uh, pretty clear, you know. And then, you know, a few years later, there's a fan. So, you know, pretty simple. It's not quite like that in the book of Isaiah. Book, uh, Isaiah's prophecies are much more complex and they're written in poetic form. So Isaiah is completely different. He writes about the impending judgment of God on his unfaithful people in uh, the form of invasion by foreign powers and also the salvation and blessings that will eventually come through a future Messiah who he describes in detail. Now these prophetic utterances are contained in five different themes or strands, I call them, uh, which are braided together to form a single image in the end, and that image, of course, is Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to examine the fifth of these strands, and here they are for purpose of review. Uh, first is the messianic hope. Talks about the messianic hope, but he doesn't always say the messianic hope. Sometimes he talks about the messianic hope as a king, and then sometimes he talks about the messianic hope as a servant. And then at other times he talks about the messianic hope as a, an anointed king. And so that's the first strand. That would be difficult enough to follow. You know, uh, one image, three different variants. There's a second strand and that's the strand of the city. And of course the city is Jerusalem. And he uses different, again, different terms for the city. Zion, uh, the mount, the mountain, and of course the name of the city itself, Jerusalem. And all of these different references are really a metaphor for God's people, all right? And God's people in, the present, in, in their present condition, God's people perhaps in the near future, God's people at the end of time. Uh, the third strand is the Holy One of Israel, the third theme, the Holy One of Israel. Here he's talking about God and he's focusing on the holiness of God. And he says, a holy God is a variety of things. A holy God is transcendent, meaning uh, God is beyond what we see here on this earth. And in his descriptions, we see an exalted vision uh, of God. Uh, a holy God is not only transcendent, but the holy God is judge and the judge of the people. And a holy God is a savior, again. So it's not just dealing with a holy God, but in various forms, okay? Transcendent God, God as judge, God as savior, and then a holy God as creator, a holy God as potter, 
a holy God as maker. And so you have to kind of you know, be on your toes. You know, who is he talking about? Is he talking about the messianic hope or is he talking about the holy God and what format is he, is he addressing uh, that personage in? So that's the third strand. The fourth strand we talked about last week, the history and faith of the Jewish people. And uh, he, doesn't, you know, he doesn't talk about the entire history of the Jewish people. He, he selects two instances. One, uh, the history and faith of the Jewish people under the king Ahaz. And he uses Ahaz as an example of faithlessness. When the people were faithless, the king was faithless. And then the history and faith of the Jewish people uh, under Hezekiah, uh, a more positive image there, even though Hezekiah at first is not uh, faithful, doesn't trust God, he ends up being faithful. Uh, so two examples there of the people of God and how they were faithful or not uh, to God. And then we have the fifth strand and that is what we're going to talk about today, the literary and structural features of Isaiah. This is mostly um, devices, poetic and literary devices that uh, Isaiah uses in his book. Okay, we're going to talk about those. This strand, uh, as I say, is not about the actual content of the book of Isaiah, but rather how that content was put together. And so to understand the writings properly requires understanding of how Isaiah arranged the material in his book and the various devices that he used in writing his book. And so the following is not a complete list, but some of the important features, some of the important literary features that Isaiah uses. Uh, first thing to consider uh, is the idea of mosaic versus linear. Mosaic versus linear. As I mentioned before, if you read the Gospels or the book of Acts, you are reading a, li a linear narrative. They be, the Gospels, for example, begin with Jesus' birth or his ministry uh, 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 and then go on to eventually his death and burial and resurrection. You know, they, all four Gospels move in the same direction. Uh, if you're reading the book of Acts, well, it tells the story of the establishment of the church at the beginning and then the ongoing work of uh, Peter and then later on Paul, uh, the apostle, to a final conclusion. Now, if you read Isaiah with this mindset, you'll become quickly confused and bored because his book is set up as a mosaic and not a linear narrative. Now, what's a mosaic? Well, a mosaic is a whole piece made with disparate parts. You got a lot of different parts, but when you put them together, they create one image. Uh, linear books follow a historical and a chronological order. Mosaics, on the other hand, use events, poetry, prophecy, history, prayers, just to name a few, but not all of the elements. They use all of these different elements in order to create a single image or portrait or tell a story, or in the case of Isaiah, convey a message from God to his chosen people, all right? Um, the second thing I want to talk about uh, in this section are literary features, literary features. We know that Hebrew poetry and literature used various features to give their writing texture and emotion and aids in understanding the exact meaning in context, just like a uh, English poetry, for example, uses the device uh, of, uh, of rhyme. You know, we, we kind of expect English poetry to rhyme. Well, uh, Hebrew poetry did not use that particular device. A good example of devices was the use of uh, what is called parallelism, uh, used extensively in the Psalms, as well as other Old Testament books including Isaiah. Some people think you know, uh, they used parallelism only in the book of Psalms. Nobody else used it, but it was a common Hebrew uh, poetic device used both in sacred literature as well as common uh, literature. Okay? 
Uh, for example, the author of a psalm, uh, when speaking of uh, parallelism, the author of a psalm would repeat the same thought or the same idea using different words in successive lines of the poem. Now there were different types of uh, parallelism. For example, there is what was called synonymous, synonymous parallelism. The second line repeats the first line using different words that have the same meaning. For example, in Psalm 19 verses one and two, the psalmist writes, the heavens are telling the glory of God, line one, line two, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Well, there's two ways of saying the same thing. You know, up in the sky, you know, the, the, the stars and the moon and all of that uh, declare God's glory and his power. And then the second line, what is he saying? Well, up in the sky, there are stars and, 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 and moons and suns you know, that, that demonstrate how powerful God is. Same idea described using different words, synonymous parallelism. Another type of parallelism was synthetic parallelism. This is where the second line adds to the first, okay? It's not the same as the first, it adds to the first. So we have in Psalm 24, for example, verses three and four, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? So there's a question, and by the way, these two lines are done as synonymous parallelism. It's the same question in both lines, all right? Then he says, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. There's synthetic parallelism. He's adding, you know, he's, he's stacking up the, the, the answer. So he asks the question, who will ascend the hill of the Lord? And then in the you know, third, fourth, and fifth verses, he, he tells you who is the one and he stacks them up. He who has clean hands, he who does not lift up his soul to what is false, uh, he who does not swear deceitfully, all right? So there's synthetic parallelism, an example of it. Another type of parallelism was antithetic, antithetic. This is where the second line contrasts the first line. So in Psalm 73, 26, we read, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So there's antithetic. The first one, my flesh and my heart may fail, discouragement, I might fail, I might not make it, right? And then the second line is the opposite, but God is the strength of my heart and he's my portion forever. Discouragement contrasted with encouragement, antithetic, all right? The second line is a contrast to the first line. Another type of uh, parallelism, climactic parallelism. Here you have successive lines build to a climax or a summary. So remember I said, it's not just in the book of Psalms that you have these devices, other, other books of the Old Testament. Habakkuk, for example, in chapter three, verses 17 to 18. So he writes, Though the fig tree does not blossom, nor the fruit tree be on the vines, the produce of the olive oil fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. So there he's building. I mean, it's a negative thing, right? But he's building. We got trouble. Things are not good. Right? The fig tree doesn't blossom, there's no fruit on the vine, the produce of the olive oil is failing, uh, the flock is cut off from the, from the, you know, from the fold, uh, no, no herd in the stalls, you know, one thing after another, trouble, 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 and then climax. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation, God the Lord is my strength climax and summary. 
So he builds, he builds, he builds, he builds negatively in this case, trouble, 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 and then climax. But the Lord, the Lord, I will rejoice in him. And he is my salvation and he is my strength, okay? So an example of climactic parallelism. Another type of par parallelism was eclectic parallelism, number five. And eclectic parallelism is a combination of different types. So you didn't just have synonymous all the time, uh, they would mix them up or they'd put two or three types of parallelism in the same passage and that type was called eclectic. Again, in Habakkuk uh, chapter one, verse two, uh, you have two synthetic, uh, 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 two synthetic parallelism, but when you combine them, uh, uh, they create a synonymous one. So let me show you. Uh, first line, O Lord, how long shall I cry out for help and you will not hear? There's synthetic uh, parallelism. Then the second line, or cry out to you violence and you will not save. They're synthetic. But if you put both lines together, they're actually a synonymous parallelism because both phrases are the same, the same thought, okay? So that's eclectic, when the writer would mix different types. Then you have what's called emphatic parallelism, emphatic parallelism. Here, Synonymous words are used for emphasis. So words that mean the same thing are repeated in order to emphasize an idea. This time we go to Deuteronomy, chapter six, verse five. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Three words really referring to the same thing, right? Three separate words referring to the same object, and that is the whole person. To love uh, with one is to love with all. I mean, if you love with all your soul, well, it's the same thing as you're loving with all your heart. And if you're loving with all your heart and all your soul, well, it's the same thing as you're loving with all your might, okay? So uh, this is called emphatic. Uh, parallelism. You use words that mean the same, but are different to get the point across. Here, the point is to love God with you know, everything you've got. And he uses three different words that mean the same thing to get the idea across, and that's called emphatic <coughs> parallelism. Now, I explain all of this to show that Isaiah, who uses these, as well as other devices throughout his book. For example, he uses imagery. Now the imagery that Isaiah uses becomes evident when comparing different passages. So in chapter one, verses 10 and 11, I want to show you uh, the idea of imagery here, okay? So in chapter one, verses 10 and 11, Isaiah says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. So he's using you know, synonymous parallelism here, isn't he, right? You know, he's saying, listen to the word of the Lord, you people in Sodom. And then he says, uh, uh, give ear to the instruction of God, you people of Gomorrah. Well, it's the same idea. He's talking to the same people and he's saying the same thing to them. Listen, pay attention to what's going on. And then in verse 11, he says, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, uh, uh, lambs, uh, or goats. So in this passage, even though he uses you know, a literary device like synonymous parallelism, uh, parallelism there's no imagery here. You know, it's, it reads like a, like a conversation. He's saying, hey, you people in Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, I take no pleasure in your sacrifices. I'm not satisfied with your worship. You know, there's no like imagery here, it's straight ahead. You can understand it. You don't need anybody to explain what he's saying. 
But if you go to, let's say chapter 43 in verse 22, he's talking about the same thing. You know, he's not happy with the worship and something is not right. And he says, yet you have not called on me, O Jacob, but you have become weary of me, O Israel. So here in this passage, it's the same problem, right? With Judah, but he uses both devices of personification. In other words, the nation is tired of God. And he also uses synonymous parallelism. The second line repeats the first line, but with different words. Uh, he, in the first line, he says, not called. And then the second line, become weary. The difference is in Isaiah 43, he's saying the same idea, the people are not worshiping him, but he uses imagery. There's emotion there. You know, he's saying, you, know, you people are tired of me. You know, you're fed up with me. As if in a, in a, in a human relationship, you know, uh, the guy says to his girlfriend, you know, I, 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 it's not you, it's me. You know? <laughs> Uh, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm just tired of our relationship. I think I've had enough. You know? well, there's imagery here and he uses imagery in trying to describe the poor relationship between uh, God and his people. So you have to understand these devices, they're not loud or showy. They're actually very low key and they're easy to miss but their variety and their repetition gives the writing a certain texture and it enables Isaiah uh, to highlight certain ideas in a work that is complex and is lengthy. If it was too dramatic and too showy, it would become wearying after several chapters, but no changes at all, no highlights at all, or no texturing devices, would also become boring in a work that is this long and repeats the same ideas uh, several times. It's one of the things we have to realize about Hebrew poetry. The, the devices used to highlight stuff are very subtle. You have to kind of you know, look for them, okay? All right, another literary feature uh, in Isaiah's uh, writing is what is called the extended doublet. The extended doublet. This feature is noted when Isaiah covers the same area of truth in the same consecutive steps, but he does it two times over. In other words, he tells the story or he makes the prophecy uh, or he gives the warning, but he does it twice or even more using a similar order of events or lessons, but he repeats it from a different perspective. It's like you get the report of a car accident from the view of the driver of the car, and then you get the report of the accident from the view of a bystander who saw the accident take place. They're both reporting the same event, but they're going to use different words and you're going to get kind of different details about that event because it's being reported from different points of view. Well, this concerns the prophecy concerning the attack. At, well, what I want to say, this is basically what Isaiah does. He repeats the same prophecy several times, but from different perspectives. So a lot of times we're reading it and you say, well, wait a minute, he just said that. I think he just said that, didn't he? Is, is this about somebody else now? No. He's using the extended doublet. In other words, he's repeating the prophecy or he's repeating the warning or whatever it is uh, several times, but from different perspectives. Now, an example of this is in chapter seven. Uh, in chapter seven, uh, it concerns the prophecy concerning the attack on Judah and Jerusalem by the combined forces of the Northern Kingdom of Israel who joined with the Arameans to overtake the southern kingdom and its principal city, Jerusalem. In the map that you see, uh, the kingdom of Judah is to the south, and then you have the kingdom of Israel to the north, and then you have to the north of that, the Arameans, Aram, with its capital of Damascus, and then further north is uh, uh, the Assyrian Empire. And so, 
uh, uh, Isaiah is talking about a time when the northern kingdom along with the Arameans combined to attack the southern kingdom. Isaiah's prophecy lists the pending attack, the need to trust the Lord, the failure that this invasion will have, and then the subsequent destruction of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians, which actually takes place in 722. Then also he talks about the future destruction of the southern kingdom by the Babylonians in 582 BC. And then the eventual coming of a savior who will be rooted in the remnant of that southern kingdom after its destruction and restoration. In other words, after all of this happens, a root, a remnant, a savior will arise from you know, the ashes of this small southern kingdom. Well, this is, this is a whole prophecy that he makes that includes all of this information starting in chapter seven and going all the way to chapter nine, okay? Now, all of this order of events is addressed to the southern kingdom by, by Isaiah's prophecy in chapter seven to nine. Now, in Isaiah chapter nine, verse eight, all the way to chapter 11, verse 16, Isaiah refers to all of the same elements, but this time from the point of view of the northern kingdom and its ultimate conqueror, Assyria. In chapter seven to nine, he speaks and records a prophecy of what is to come. In chapters nine to 11, he pronounces a judgment that will come for what the northern kingdom and the Arameans tried to do to Jerusalem. Again, all to take place in the future. This is amazing. <laughs> he prophesies what's going to happen you know, to the southern kingdom by these kingdoms here. And then he prophesies what will happen to that northern kingdom because of what it tried to do. And all of the things he's talking about are all going to happen in the future. So in both instances, Isaiah ends his prophecies with the description of the promised savior to come. The same promise, but a different description. If we're not aware of the device that he's using, we might start to think, is there, are there two saviors supposed to come? No, he's talking about the same savior and he's talking about the same group of events, uh, but from a different perspective. In other sections of his book, Isaiah uses this repetition device, the extended doublet, for not just two, but three times in reference to a single event or a person or a theme. For example, um, you know, the, let's say we go back to our analogy of the accident. So you have the, the driver, so, you know, his report of what happened. You have the bystander, his report of what happened, and then you have the police report, and the police's, you know, policeman's report of what took place. Three different records of one single uh, event. Well, this is what Isaiah uh, does. In uh, chapters uh, 28 and 29, uh, the north and south kingdoms are warned, but they're warned twice. In chapters 30 all the way to 35, Judah is warned against making alliances with other nations uh, and warned three times. The same warning for the same thing with the same results, but the warning is repeated over and over again. Now I mentioned these because understanding the types of literary devices used by the author and how they work, you know, parallelism and, uh, you know, uh, imagery and so on and so forth. This helps us to discern the correct and intended meaning of the text. So we've looked at the mosaic layout for Isaiah's book. Uh, we've also uh, examined several of the literary features like parallelism and imagery, and then of course the extended doublet. One last point about Isaiah's writing, which is often uh, debated is, Single author versus school of authors, okay? Single author versus school of authors. As I mentioned before, one of the main debates concerning this book is if it was written by a single person, 
a man called Isaiah who lived in the eighth and seventh century uh, and served as a prophet. Was, it, was the book written only by him or was it written by a school of prophets or a school of writers who produced the material based on Isaiah's initial work, but they wrote over a period of several centuries ending their work in uh, around 435 BC. The school of writers theory argues that the variety of styles and devices in Isaiah's book can be explained by the fact that the book was actually written by multiple authors over a period of several uh, centuries. Of course, those who hold this position also use this idea as a basis to deny the possibility of predictive prophecy. You know, it's an easy way to say, well, you know, how could he have done this? How could he have foretold the future? Well, he didn't. You know, every century there were writers writing about contemporary events you know, and making it sound like a prophecy. For these people, the school of prophets or writers producing material over a number of centuries, this theory provides a rational answer to explain the many prophetical sections of the book of Isaiah. If you read the book of Isaiah and realize what he's talking about, you're like, wow, I mean, it blows your mind, you know, that his prophecies were so accurate and so crisp and clear, especially about uh, the Messiah. Uh, if you believe uh, that uh, uh, different authors wrote it over a period of several centuries, well, then it's, it's not as spectacular. Um, they see uh, Isaiah's book as history and not prophecy. Of course, the single author understanding of Isaiah requires no special explanation since Isaiah is a known historical figure who lived and had access to the people and the events that he writes about. Uh, not to mention that the book is, um, uh, is self, itself is presented as the work of a single author. If you read the book, there's nothing in it that suggests that it was written by several different people. If you read the book of Isaiah, you walk away thinking, oh, this was written by one person, okay? Of course, for those who believe that God used prophets like Isaiah and Daniel and Jeremiah and others to communicate to the Jews and through them to communicate to us who believe today, the single, the single author idea is no stretch. There's no stretch for me to believe that Isaiah was the one who wrote. I mean, if God said, let there be light, and then boom, there was light, you know, uh, it's not hard for me to believe that you know, he empowered Isaiah to write this book, okay? Um, for the, uh, those who believe the idea that a man spoke accurately from God about the present, the near future, the distant future, and the end times, this is an acceptable and natural demonstration of the work of the Holy Spirit in one of God's servants. In this case, a man named Isaiah. Now to properly understand the content and appreciate the power of Isaiah's book, we must see that it is a mosaic fashioned from parts of poetry and history and prophecy and narrative and all of this combined to fashion a single message from God relevant to every generation of his people starting with the Jews of that day in King Uzziah's time to the member of the Lord's church today. So Isaiah is relevant uh, to the people Isaiah was talking about, just as it is relevant to you know, the members of the Choctaw congregation and those who follow this class online. So let's summarize. Isaiah uses a variety of literary devices and historical narrative that are used as a framework for his messages and prophecies from God to the Jewish people and also to the surrounding nations. That's another thing. You read about curses and warnings, you know, and you're thinking, well, I think I thought he already warned the Jews. Well, no, pay attention. Many times he's talking to other nations around, the Philistines and Moab and you know, different nations around uh, Judea and, and Israel. As I mentioned in a previous lesson, Isaiah's book can be divided into three main sections. Section one, 
Messages Relating to God's Judgment, chapters one to 35. Section number two, the historical account of Hezekiah's reign, chapters 36 to 39. Those are the easiest chapters to read because they're a historical narrative, okay? And then the third section, Messages Relating to God's Mercy, chapters 40 to 66. So if, as you read the book, you feel that it is gloomy and harsh, this is because more than half of it deals with warnings and judgments against the northern and southern kingdoms, as well as a dozen or so surrounding nations. So yes, <laughs> first half of the book is, is pretty gloomy, you know, a lot of warnings, a lot of curses. Of course, it's not all doom and gloom, Mixed in with the judgments are the promises of a savior and the story of God saving Hezekiah and Jerusalem uh, uh, from such destruction uh, from a foreign army and, and, and the most comprehensive description of the Messiah himself and the way that he would achieve salvation and the name of that salvation found, excuse me, the nature of that salvation found anywhere in the Old Testament. In other words, Isaiah describes Jesus more clearly than any other prophet. And he also describes the, the way that God would save mankind uh, through vicarious atonement. And he explains that you know, 700 years before it takes place. Now, I have given to you a, a second sheet. And uh, that second sheet is a detailed outline of Isaiah. I got this from uh, truthsaves.org. I looked around for several uh, uh, outlines and this one I found was pretty complete. Uh, we don't have time, I think we have about two minutes left in the class. I don't have time to read the outline to you, but you, you have it yourself. This outline gives you almost a, you know, a line by line you know, uh, a summary of all of the sections of the book of Isaiah, beginning with you know, messages relating to judgment, chapters one to 35, the opening call of God, chapter one, to Judah, to Jerusalem, B, a, world concerning, a word concerning Judah and Jerusalem, chapters two to five, and the subdivision of all that. Well, <clears throat> I'd like for you to hang on to this outline, keep it folded in your Bible. This outline is a guide in reading the book since with it, you always know the context of what Isaiah is talking about. So you're reading Isaiah, but you've got your outline and you always know, oh, oh this is what he's doing. You know, he's pronouncing a judgment against this nation. Oh, against this nation. So you'll always know where you're at if you manage to keep this outline while you're reading. Now, the key idea in Isaiah is that the Messiah is coming, even though the term Messiah is only used in reference to Cyrus, the king of the Medes and the Persians in Isaiah 45 verse one. Isn't that, isn't that strange that he's always talking about the Messiah to come, but he only uses the term Messiah uh, for uh, the, the Persian king. Uh, again, we're not going to do a line by line study from here forward, but we're going to select key passages to preach a variety of lessons using Isaiah as our springboard. Uh, you now have a, a detailed outline and information on the features to guide you as you read Isaiah. So now I'm going to give you some homework because now I'm going to start preaching from different parts of Isaiah. And you, you already have some of the background, so now you'll know, you know what I'm talking about when I begin preaching. So your first homework assignment is to read chapter uh, Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1 to chapter 5 verse 30. That's not too burdensome. Five chapters. Read those five chapters. Uh, next Sunday I'll be preaching uh, uh, from uh, this, uh, from this uh, section. All right. Well that's our lesson for this morning uh, and that's the final lesson in the preparatory uh, you know, material. Next week we actually get into the book begin teaching through the book uh, and begin developing some lessons from the book of Isaiah. Okay, thank you for your attention and we'll see you next week if the Lord is willing.